So after the release of Metal Gear Solid 2, Kojima and the team quickly got to work on their next sequel, with the plan being that it would become a launch title for Sony's upcoming PlayStation 3. The team planned a lot of the technical aspects of the game around the power of the new hardware, but due to the fact that the system wouldn't release until the holiday season of 2006, the development of Metal Gear Solid 3 was moved back to the PlayStation 2, and it would ultimately release in November of 2004, a whole two years ahead of the original schedule. And while sequels in the Metal Gear series can definitely be controversial, this one would go on to become the majority of players' favorite game in the series. And on top of even that, returning viewers will know that an upcoming remake of this game is the entire reason that I started this series in the first place, so there's a little bit of excitement going in for me too. So is Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater really the best game in the Metal Gear franchise so far, or does it fall short of what came before it? Well, let's talk about it. And before getting too far into the video, I should mention that this is the 8th in a series of videos where I'm playing every Metal Gear game for the first time and reviewing them as I go along in preparation for Metal Gear Delta. And while you don't have to have seen the rest of the videos in order to enjoy this one, you will be missing a lot of important context about my journey with the series if you haven't seen them, so I'll have the full playlist linked in the description below for those of you that want to go check those out first. But with that out of the way, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is an action-adventure stealth game developed and published by Konami and released for the PlayStation 2 in 2004. And to clarify right off the bat, for the sake of this video, I did play the original Snake Eater release of the game for a few reasons that we'll get into a bit later, and I played on an emulator just to upscale the footage so that the video looks a lot nicer than the PlayStation's native 480p. There are some small visual glitches that came from the emulator that you might catch throughout the video, but nothing major, and if you happen to see them, now you know why they're there. Anyway, starting up the game, we get an opening of Snake jumping out of the back of a plane to deploy on his new mission. During the jump, we get a flashback to the briefing, with it being explained to us that there is a Soviet rocket scientist named Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov who wants to defect to the West after becoming afraid of his own creations. They managed to get him over the Berlin Wall, but the Cuban Missile Crisis began a week afterwards, and to prevent a nuclear holocaust, the US gave Sokolov back to them in exchange for Russia's missiles being pulled out of Cuba. It's been a couple of years since that happened though, and intelligence recently found out that he's been put back to work on new weapons for the Soviet Union, so we're being sent into Selinoyarsk, Russia to extract him. This mission is referred to as the Virtuous Mission, something that you'll need to keep in mind if you're not already familiar with the story. And this whole setup is great, but there's something really weird about it. See, the marketing had revolved heavily around Snake being the sole protagonist of the series again, as well as the new setting of a Russian jungle, but what it didn't focus on was the fact that this game would take place in the 1960s, placing it about 30 years before the original Metal Gear in the timeline. It's something that if you went in not knowing about it would make no sense, but as we'll come back to in a bit, it fits into the series very well, despite what players might initially think. Anyway, we land in the jungle, and we get introduced to the new cast of characters for the game. Firstly, there's Snake, who is weirdly being referred to as Jack by other characters throughout the opening, before the man in charge of the operation gives us our codename, Naked Snake. This man then introduces himself as Major Tom, and he's essentially the replacement for Colonel Campbell in this game, just being the guy in charge who we can call if we find ourselves in a bad spot. Along with him though, we also have Paramedic, and she serves as a medical advisor for the mission, as well as the person that we need to call if we want to save our game. And lastly, there's the boss, Naked Snake's former mentor, who's radioing to us from an offshore submarine, but who's here to help Snake with her expertise in weapons and tactics. But after we get through the introductions, it's time for us to go and find our backpack, which got snagged on a tree branch on the way in. This is a great way for the developers to immediately start showing us some of the new mechanics of the game, which in this case is the fact that players can now climb trees. I can't say that this is a mechanic that I ever found to be all that useful for stealth, as whenever I would try to hide in a tree to get the drop on someone, they would just see me from a mile away, but it is a really cool way for the designers to immediately tell players, hey, you're in the jungle now, so we expect you to do some jungle things. And as much as the jungle environment shakes up the gameplay, not to mention the fact that it's just a very fresh setting for the series, only ever being seen for short sections of the 2D games previously, it does come at a cost. See, the PS2 version of Metal Gear Solid 3 was capped at 30 frames per second, and a lot of the time, it struggled to maintain that frame rate, commonly dipping into the 20s. 
Playing on a modern PC, it was very easy to maintain that 30 FPS limit, but coming off the back of Metal Gear Solid 2, it's definitely a noticeable step down in the overall smoothness of the experience. But after we get our backpack, Major Tom gives us a quick rundown of more of the game's new mechanics. Firstly, suppressors now have durability, meaning that as you fire a suppressed weapon, the suppressor will eventually break, requiring players to either equip a new one or go find one if they don't already have a spare suppressor on hand. This fixes a pretty large balancing problem that the solid games have had up to this point, where players were able to just eliminate all the enemies they came across with a suppressed weapon and move on. You can try to do that here in Snake Eater, but after enough shots are fired with them, you'll eventually have to find a new strategy to use to continue to progress. On top of that, various new survival systems have been added to the game in order to make the most of the jungle setting, and these can be pretty interesting. Things like needing to hunt for food and make sure that Snake eats once in a while in order to keep the stamina gauge up, which affects a lot of Snake's actions like hanging off of ledges or diving underwater. As well as that, if your stamina meter goes below 50%, Snake's stomach will start to growl, potentially alerting nearby guards. Continuing with the early radio conversations though, we get one where Snake tells the boss that he's thankful she taught him the techniques that she did, but he asked why she never taught him to think like a soldier, and she answers that she can't teach him that and that he'll have to learn on his own through experience. Major Tom then cuts in, explaining to us that the Snake codename was chosen after the boss's special forces unit in World War II, which was known as the Cobra Unit. With all of that out of the way though, we finally start to move towards where we believe Sokolov is being held, before the boss calls us again, explaining yet another new system to us, the Camouflage System. In this game, Snake can make use of various different patterned uniforms and face paints to camouflage himself with the environment, with your concealment level being displayed in the top right of the screen at all times. This is a really cool touch, and it's super fun for the first couple hours of the game, but it has one glaring problem. I'm sure that I'm not the first one to bring this up, but needing to pause the game and go through the menus to change your camouflage so regularly gets really annoying really early on. And in my case, it led to me experimenting to find the best all-around camos and just using those for the majority of the game. I did mess around with camouflaging myself more precisely from time to time, but a lot of the time you'll notice that my concealment isn't very high, and that's honestly just because I was so annoyed by how often I was being pushed into pausing the game and decided that I would just focus on being more careful in my approach over camouflaging myself with the environment, and I'm really glad that I approached it that way as I definitely had more fun with the game overall because of it. And in these early areas, we get introduced to the various types of wildlife that we can expect to encounter throughout the jungle. Like I mentioned earlier, you can hunt the various animals you'll come across for food, but some of them are also just outwardly hostile. Things like snakes and crocodiles are found commonly, and players need to be very careful around them if they decide to leave them alive, and I have to say, sneaking around in a swamp full of crocodiles is some of the most tense gameplay of any of the Metal Gear games so far. And while we're on the topic of sneaking, stealth has been made much more deep than in the previous game, and much more challenging along with that. Guards have once again been made much more aware, meaning that they'll spot you more easily if you run out in the open. And in terms of adding mechanics, there's now a fully fleshed out CQC system, giving you multiple options for how to take down guards up close. Of course, you can still go up behind guards and choke them out or snap their necks like in previous entries, but they've also now added a move where you can slam enemies into the ground for a much louder, albeit instant takedown. Or for the more bloodthirsty player, once you've got your knife up to a guard's throat, you can simply slit it while grabbing them for a silent kill. And of course, if you just want to use your basic melee combo, you certainly can, though I found almost no reason to use it now that there are so many other options that are just far more efficient. And something that I noticed after only the first couple encounters with guards is that the directional audio in this game feels pretty off. I found it very difficult to determine where a sound was coming from in this game based on what I heard, as I would often hear a sound and think it was to my left let's say, and then I would turn to the left and suddenly it would sound like it's coming from the right, so I would turn back to the right and it would be in my left ear again. I'm not sure if it's just a problem with me, but I really found that I just couldn't rely on the audio to know where an enemy was in this game, and after the first few hours, I just started ignoring the directional audio and using my eyes instead. Anyway, we eventually make it to where they're holding Sokolov, with him asking if we're one of Volgan's men. 
We tell him that we're not and that we've been sent in by the CIA, and he tells us that we need to get him out of there before a man named Colonel Volgan and his men arrive, explaining that he's the head of the GRU military intelligence agency who's trying to overthrow the USSR's leadership and take control for himself. We radio into the Major to tell him that we found Sokolov, with him mentioning that they lost contact with the boss, but he assumes that it's just a weak signal due to the fact that she's in a submarine, telling us to just focus on extracting Sokolov. On the way out though, we're surrounded by guards before a man the guards call Ocelot walks up wearing a different uniform and seemingly having some beef with them. He proceeds to quickly draw his pistol and gun each of them down, even flipping the thing around and hitting ricochet shots while doing so. And during the panic, Sokolov takes his opportunity to escape, running into the jungle. Ocelot then walks over to us, mentioning that we aren't actually the boss like he thought we were, before signaling to his allies to come out. He goes to kill us, but his gun jams, and taking the opportunity, Snake disarms him, dealing with him and his allies before making fun of him, saying that his shooting technique isn't really made out for an automatic pistol and would be better suited using a revolver, but complimenting him on his fancy shooting nonetheless. We call the Major, filling him in on the power struggle between the KGB and the Gru before he tells us to figure out where Sokolov ran off to. We eventually catch up to him, with him explaining that he's worried the Gru will capture him before we see what he was being forced to create. The Shagohod, a nuclear-equipped mobile tank. He explains to us that they've only just finished working on Phase 1, and that we shouldn't be too worried about leaving it there since it won't be complete until they get through Phase 2, which they won't be able to without him. We continue escorting him to the pickup point before we encounter the boss on a bridge. She tells us that Sokolov is going with her before a massive swarm of hornets appears and a man hanging upside down and being carried by the swarm swoops Sokolov up into a helicopter. We see a strange visage of a man behind her before a towering man surrounded by lightning approaches us. She addresses him as Colonel Volgan with him welcoming her into his unit. She then explains to us that she's defecting to the Soviet Union and that she's brought two Davy Crockett nuclear warheads as a gift for Volgan. He asks if we're going to be going with them, with her telling him that we haven't found our emotion to take into battle yet, swiftly disarming us and breaking our arm before throwing us into the river below, leaving us to die. We wake up downstream, but Snake is in critical conditions, so paramedic radios in to teach us the new healing mechanics of the game. Rather than using a basic healing item to heal back from damage in this game, players will now need to pause the game and go to the cure menu to examine their injuries and apply treatment manually depending on the nature of said injury. For example, if you suffer a deep cut, you'll need to disinfect the wound, stitch it up, and then cover it with some styptic and bandages. These items are all of course limited and need to be found in the environments, so you still need to scavenge for healing items, it's just that now you need to find much more specific items than before. Much like the camouflage, this is a really cool system for the first couple hours of the game, but needing to pause the game and go through the menus gets really obnoxious after you've played for a while. Unlike the camouflage system though, you can't really avoid this system if you don't want to spend that much time in the menus, as you'll literally need to use it to stay alive. And of course, because of the presence of the camouflage system as well as eating food also being done through the pause menu, these all just compound on top of one another to disrupt the flow of gameplay even more than they would on their own. But after getting patched up, we see the Gru airlifting the Shagohod out of the area before Volgan decides that he wants to test out the new toy that the boss brought him, launching a nuke at the KGB research lab nearby. We get evacuated from the area shortly afterwards, and here we get one of the best opening credits sequences I think I've ever seen. And on that note, I have to say that MGS3 has significantly stepped up its cinematic presentation from MGS2. The cinematography has been improved across the board, the choreography of action scenes has been massively improved, and the complex facial animations look much more natural here than they did in that game, all leading to a much better overall presentation. But after we finish jamming out, we cut to two weeks later where the US president and the head of the Soviet Union have a call discussing the boss's defection, where the president denies having any involvement with the incident. 
Khrushchev doesn't completely trust him though, as they picked up a signal from the plane that evacuated Snake shortly afterwards. So he tells him that the US needs to prove their innocence in the explosion of the lab, and Snake gets redeployed to Selinoyarsk to eliminate the boss. The CIA adds in some extra objectives for us though, telling us that we also need to rescue Sokolov and destroy the Shagohod while we're there. Major Tom changes his codename to Major Zero on our arrival as well, and we get a new weapons expert on the support team, Mr. Sigan. We're told that we need to go meet up with our KGB contact who goes by Adam, and the Major tells us that the password to verify his identity is to ask who are the Patriots, and have him respond with Lolly Lule Lo. And with this, Operation Snake Eater is a go. Shortly after our arrival, we run into the boss, who disarms us and drops us on our ass again, dismantling our tranquilizer gun and telling us to go home. Snake asks her why she defected, and she says that she didn't and that she's simply loyal to her own beliefs. She shoots the craft that we were dropped in with until it blows up, telling us that the guards will be by soon and that we better run before disappearing again. We evade the guards, making our way to the meeting point, where we come across a woman who tells us that Adam couldn't make it. Snake asks her for the password, but she doesn't seem to know it, and suddenly we're surrounded by guards. She shoots them for us, earning our trust and introducing herself as Eva, Adam's partner, while Snake makes some… very important observations. She explains that Adam couldn't make it as Volgan decided that he could no longer trust him, and that Sokolov is being held in a secret lab further into the jungle. She then hands us a suppressed 1911 pistol, as well as a replacement for our tranquilizer gun, and a disguise to sneak into the secret lab with. Snake takes a short rest, but when we wake up, the Ocelot unit has surrounded the facility. But it's nothing to worry about, as Snake has his mind on what really matters. This leads into a really fun encounter where we have to sneak around, carefully picking off the Ocelot soldiers one by one before disappearing again to wait for our next opportunity. But this encounter is where the camera problems in the game started to become apparent for me. I mentioned earlier that I played the original PS2 release for a small handful of reasons, and the camera just so happens to be one of them. Every later release of Metal Gear Solid 3 got a freely rotating camera that the player controls, but the original Snake Eater release used fixed camera angles like what was seen in MGS 1 and 2. And there's actually an interview with Kojima where he explains that even though player controlled cameras had already become the standard in the industry at this point, he intentionally stuck with the fixed camera in this game as it made it feel more like a coherent part of a trilogy as well as adding to the cinematic flair that he always wanted these games to have. In the last couple games, I never had problems with the camera at all, likely due to the fact that they took place almost entirely indoors, but here in MGS3, the environments just feel far too open for them to work. There were a lot of times where I couldn't look at the guards near me unless I stopped moving and used the first person view, and this, combined with the improved AI and vision ranges that the guards now have, can lead to some pretty frustrating moments. Also during the Ocelot encounter, I noticed for the first time that life now slowly regenerates in this game, which was a very welcome addition to somewhat balance out the tedium of using the cure system. If you take a small hit that doesn't inflict a major injury, it will simply heal itself over time, but once you get something like a gunshot wound or a broken bone, you'll need to use the cure system to treat it properly. It's not a perfect system by any means, but it would be so much worse without the passive healing, so I'll take what I can get. After we deal with the guards though, Ocelot reveals himself, having captured Eva and now wielding a revolver rather than the Makarov he had two weeks prior. He goes to shoot us, but he's already fired off all six rounds, being used to the higher mag capacity of the automatic pistols. In the confusion, Eva manages to escape, hitting him with her motorcycle and forcing him to run away. After this, we start moving towards the lab, and shortly after we leave, we get a call from Eva, with her explaining that the only difference between the US and Russia is one of perspective. She says that both countries simply feed their citizens lies to keep them complacent and believing what they want them to, and once she learned that, she defected to the Soviet Union. Shortly after this, I was moving through a swamp area and tried to call paramedic for some information about the wildlife there, and she pointed out that I had leeches stuck to me from moving through the swamp that were rapidly draining my stamina, and that I would need to remove them in the cure menu, only adding to the list of things that players need to keep in mind while moving through the jungle. 
And just after that, I ran into a tripwire that dropped a trap on me, and shortly after that, a large field filled with claymores. Again, just the designers slowly piling on the various hazards to ensure that players will move carefully through the jungle and not just rush through the stealth sections of the game. Continuing forward though, we're ambushed by Ocelot and his men once again, except this time he dismisses the Ocelot unit, showing us his sweet revolver tricks and challenging us to a duel. This starts the first boss fight in the game, and it's a pretty solid one. Snake and Ocelot are on two opposite ends of a small canyon, with both of our sides having a ton of rocks and trees that can be used as cover. The fight itself is essentially just a basic shootout, but running around to bait out his shots and choosing the right moments to stop and fire back yourself is pretty fun. And as the fight goes on, Ocelot becomes more and more accustomed to using his new revolvers, becoming more quick and aggressive throughout the battle. Before we get to finish up though, we get attacked by a swarm of hornets, leading to Ocelot running away again and Snake falling into a cave in his own attempt to escape. We move through the cave, obtaining some new items to make the process easier, and this is where I realize that I really don't like the new inventory system in this game. MGS3 uses the same scrolling item and weapon wheels from MGS1 and 2, but this time they're limited to only 8 items and weapons per side. You can still carry every item in the game at once, but if you want to equip a certain item, you'll need to pause the game and go into the new backpack menu to set what items and weapons you have on your quick select. And while the inventory navigation wasn't perfect by any means in the previous games, needing to frequently pause your game and navigate extra menus just to equip items only slows down the process even more than before, and I definitely feel that this is the worst inventory system of the Solid Trilogy. Further into the cave though, we encounter the Pain, the source of the Hornets, and the first member of the boss's Cobra unit. And this is a really fun boss fight, with us needing to swim through the water in the cave to avoid his Hornets and lose his line of sight, before climbing up onto the rocks to take our opportunities to attack him. Unfortunately, he can be pretty easily cheesed by just using stun grenades, but it's a really fun fight nonetheless. We eventually manage to defeat him, but weirdly, there's no monologue or anything as he dies, he kind of just falls onto his back and then explodes, meaning that we don't really get the opportunity to learn anything about him. We move forward, exiting the cave, and we see some strange UFOs above, which turn out to be some strange new hovercraft that the enemy guards are using to patrol the swamps. We sneak past the patrols, and at the end of the swamp, we come across a warehouse where we see Sokolov being threatened by Volgan, with his lover being electrocuted in front of him whenever Sokolov refuses to do what they tell him. The boss then appears, informing Volgan that the pain is dead, which greatly angers him, and he tells her that she needs to eliminate Snake before the final tests for the Shagohod are complete. She tells him that the Cobras will be able to handle him, sending out the next member, the Fear, to hunt us down. And while sneaking into the warehouse, I realized something that I'm shocked took me so long to notice. In Metal Gear Solid 3, the mobile radar that was present in the previous games is gone, leaving us to rely purely on what we can see and hear to keep track of the guards. The mobile radar can still be accessed in the form of an item that runs on batteries that you have to find in the environment, but these are fairly uncommon, so even if you try to abuse it, you'll rarely be able to. And while I definitely like the idea of removing the radar from these games, it probably shouldn't have been done in a game with such an inconsistent camera. Despite how difficult the stealth in this game can be to get used to though, I would say that this is by far the easiest Metal Gear game in the franchise up to this point. Not because it's easy to avoid alerts, as I personally raised a lot of alerts throughout my playthrough thanks to my skill issue, but when you get into combat, the balancing in this game is just awful. The combat is so heavily balanced in the player's favor thanks to a couple of key factors, those being the new CQC mechanics and the damage that enemies actually deal. When getting shot at, you take almost no damage, and I mentioned it earlier, but there's a new move that's been added to the game that allows you to flip enemy guards over and instantly knock them out, meaning that during an alert, the easiest way to deal with the guards attacking you is to just run straight towards them and use that flip move to instantly take them out. I'm sure that this strategy won't work as well on higher difficulties, but on normal difficulty, I was able to use this to quickly get myself out of a bad spot all the way into the end game. And it's really interesting, because this game ends up being even easier than the Twin Snakes, but the issue between the two is completely different. 
in the Twin Snakes, the stealth was far too easy, making it so that you would almost never get into combat, but if you did, it was just as difficult and just as threatening as in the previous games. But here in MGS3, if you get into combat, it's just almost impossible to die unless you're actively trying to. There were even some instances in this game where when I was spotted, I wanted to just retry the stealth and I would think about getting myself killed intentionally, but then I would change my mind because of how long it would take for that to even happen. Ultimately, I ended up suffering the least deaths in my playthrough out of the entire series here, and I would like to reiterate that that's not because I'm good at the game at all, because quite frankly, I'm not. Anyway, we eventually get to the secret lab, and we meet a man who tells us that Sokolov has been moved elsewhere. He introduces himself as Alexander Leonovich Granin, the foremost weapons scientist in the Soviet Union, who just so happens to be very drunk. He explains that because of Sokolov's Shagohod, his research now effectively means nothing and he's been stripped of his authority. He reveals to us that he's been working on a successor to the Shagohod, which is a bipedal walking tank that he believes will fill that missing link between infantry and artillery. He then mentions something called the Philosopher's Legacy, saying that it's funded the entirety of their experiments at the facility, before explaining that Sokolov has been moved to a fortress in the mountains called Groznygrad. He also tells us that there's an underground tunnel that might be able to get us inside, before handing us a key that we'll need to get there. We ask why he's helping us, and he says that because of Sokolov, all of his life's work has meant nothing, and he wants things to go back to the way they used to be. So we leave the facility, moving towards Groznygrad, but we suddenly get shot in the leg by an arrow before the fear reveals himself to us. He explains that the bolt we've been hit by is coated in the venom of the Brazilian wandering spider before a boss fight ensues. And much like what happened with the vamp fight in MGS2, I might have entirely missed the point, but this fight felt very underwhelming to me. The fear bounces around in the trees to evade you, eventually stopping to fire another crossbow bolt at you. And I'm not exaggerating in the slightest when I tell you that to beat this fight, I stood in place and used first person aiming to shoot at him until he died. It's entirely possible that I missed the point, but as far as I can tell, this boss is really just a matter of shooting at them until they die, no special gimmicks or weaknesses that need to be exploited which would normally lead to that feeling of solving a combat puzzle, just stand there and shoot. And once the fight is over, much like when we fought the pain, we don't get to learn anything about him before he dies, he just suddenly explodes, and that's that. And after my fight with the fear, I actually had one crossbow bolt bug out and get stuck in my arm for the entire remainder of my playthrough, so yeah, get used to seeing this little guy. We continue along before Eva calls, telling us that Sokolov is putting the finishing touches on Shagohod's phase 2, and that we need to hurry so that they don't kill him once he finishes his work. She also mentions that the next of the Cobras is waiting for us in the jungle ahead, a lone sniper known as The End. And while we're back in the jungle again, now would be a good time to talk about how much more varied and interesting the level design is in this game compared to the previous Solid games. The jungle isn't just visually interesting, with the addition of things like the thick overgrown grass, hollow logs, and all the other pieces of the environment that can now be used to conceal yourself from guards makes stealth a lot deeper. On top of that, they've kept that vertical tension that they started playing around with in MGS2, having a lot of small cliffs that you can use to do things like stalk a guard from above, before dropping off the ledge to choke him out and dragging him into the grass. The moment-to-moment -moment stealth gameplay is much more interesting here than it was in MGS1 and 2, and if you're someone who enjoys a good stealth game, this will definitely deliver on that for you. And on the topic of gameplay, there are much longer stretches of gameplay between story moments here than in the previous Metal Gear Solid games, which I'm sure is a huge factor in the amount of people who love this game more than the rest. I know that some people in the comments of my MGS2 video said that they found the amount of dialogue and cutscenes in that game obnoxious at times, and it makes me wonder if that was a common criticism at the time of its release as well, as Snake Eater has the longest stretches of gameplay out of the entire trilogy. I know that a video like this can make the story feel like it's moving at a pretty rapid pace, but keep in mind that this game took me about 14 hours to play through, and a lot of the story segments that I'm covering here have long stretches of sneaking through the jungle in between. Moving forward, we eventually come across The End, who thanks us for showing up when we did, as if we had taken too much longer, he likely would have died of old age. He tells us that we'll be his final hunt, and a boss fight begins. 
Eva calls us and warns that this is going to be a fight of endurance, and man, she really wasn't kidding. This fight is essentially the sniper wolf fight from Metal Gear Solid 1, but made infinitely more interesting in terms of its gameplay. The end will run around between different sniper perches and hiding spots, and even between different areas of the jungle to set up traps for you, and while you can play this like a traditional sniper duel, you can also try to sneak up on him and take him down non-lethally. Both Snake and The End are masters of camouflage, so this ends up becoming a really tense game of cat and mouse, with both of you trying to sneak up on and set up traps for the other, and it's easily the best fight in the game in my opinion. But after dealing enough damage, we get an actual death scene from him, albeit a very short one. He tells us that the boss would be proud of us, and says that the world needs to be passed on to a younger generation, before his teeth pop out of his skull and he suddenly explodes. But moving on from that, we find a small tunnel in the side of a cliff that has a ladder in it, and I shit you not, I climbed this ladder for two minutes straight, and it even took so long that the designers decided to start playing the game's opening theme just to keep players entertained. At the top of this ladder though, we find ourselves in a new mountaintop area that's easily one of the highlights of the game in terms of stealth. We get to climb up the side of the mountain while not only evading the guards, but also a hind that's patrolling the area, and the higher up we go, the more trenches and bunkers there are placed throughout the level, and it's really satisfying to evade the helicopter by laying still against the ground with camouflage, and dip in and out of the trenches to evade the guards on the ground. We eventually meet up with Eva on the top of the mountain, and she tells us that Khrushchev and his forces are on their way to the base, meaning that shit's going to hit the fan really soon and we have to hurry up. She explains to us that Sokolov is being held in the west wing of the weapons lab, but that the west wing has incredibly high security and will have to gain colonel clearance in order to sneak in. She then tells us to steal a uniform from Colonel Rydenovich Rykov, who just so happens to look like this. Right. Eva then asks what the history between Snake and the boss is, with Snake explaining that they were partners for 10 years, and when Eva asks if he's sure that he'll be able to kill her, he struggles to respond. From here, we continue towards Groznygrad, and she goes off to secure our escape. From the mountaintop, we observe a conversation between Volgan and Ocelot, where Ocelot is clearly growing displeased with the colonel's methods. The boss then appears, informing them that the fear and the end have also been killed, which only continues to anger Volgan further. She also tells him that America seeks to destroy the Shagohod, as well as take Volgan's philosopher's legacy, before leaving to prepare for our arrival. Taking the underground tunnel to Groznygrad, we run into the fourth member of the Cobra unit, the Fury. He makes use of a flamethrower and a jetpack, leading to a fight that's very visually interesting, but again, I'm not so sure about this one gameplay-wise. Similar to the fear, this fight doesn't really have any unique mechanics that differentiate it from the rest, essentially just boiling down to avoiding his flamethrower attacks and shooting him with our guns whenever we're given the chance. Once we defeat him, he flies towards the ceiling of the tunnel and, you guessed it, blows up. Except this time, a giant flame cloud comes out of him, still attempting to kill us. For a moment, I thought we would be getting a second phase to the fight where things would actually heat up a bit, pun very much intended by the way, but alas, Snake simply runs away and climbs up a ladder that brings us straight into Groznygrad. We infiltrate the base, finding Major Rykov and hiding him in a locker where no one will find him so that we can steal his uniform to enter the West Wing. Now we can move through the base without suspicion, aside from the crossbow bolt sticking out of my right arm of course. And I have to say, I always love these sections of the Metal Gear games where we get to use a disguise to infiltrate the enemy's ranks, as it feels like the ultimate form of stealth to be able to just walk by the guards in the open and have them not suspect a thing. We make our way over to the West Wing, finding Sokolov having a conversation with his lover, with him handing her what looks like a small bit of tape and her asking about the philosopher's legacy, and vaguely threatening to kill him if he doesn't tell her what she wants to know. We hide around the corner, and after she leaves, we go in to pick him up, with him recognizing us from two weeks prior. 
He tells us that we're too late though, explaining that phase two is already complete and that they've attached a rocket booster to the frame of the Shagohod, allowing it to travel at more than 300 miles per hour while firing nuclear missiles, allowing them to skip the first stage of a missile launch and being able to deploy them much more quickly. He tells us that the only prototype is being held here in the base, but that Volgan is going to mass produce the Shagohod and have them deployed all over the Soviet Union. Snake tells him that it's not too late though, and that they just need to destroy the facility and the prototype to prevent it from going to mass production. Sokolov then explains to us that we could plant explosives on the fuel tanks around the hangar, before telling us that there was a female spy here just before us, who stole the experimental C3 from the base's armory. Snake responds that he thought that they were lovers, but Sokolov corrects him, saying that she is Volgan's lover, Tatiana, and that she was sent by Khrushchev, arriving a few days before the virtuous mission. He tells us to leave him behind to die with the facility, explaining that even if he did flee to the US, he would still just be used by them to create weapons of mass destruction, saying that his creations are simply tools of politicians that ultimately exist to harm mankind. Then out of nowhere, Volgan walks in, saying that he's been waiting for us in his room, grabbing us by the crotch and knowing that we're a spy based purely on the size of Snake's package. Oh my god! Wow! He shoots Sokolov in the legs before Snake disarms him and knocks him to the ground before the boss appears, disarming us. We grapple with her for a minute or so before she ultimately bests us, handing us over to Volgan, who then proceeds to beat the living shit out of Snake until he passes out. We wake up in the Groznygrad torture room to the sound of Volgan killing Sokolov before he turns his attention to us, beating on us and demanding to know how much the CIA knows and asking if they're after the philosopher's legacy. During this, he drops some details about the legacy, mentioning that it was a fund established by the three great powers during the two world wars, and that it's a total of more than 200 billion dollars. While he's torturing us, a transmitter falls off of our body, with the boss revealing that she was the one that planted it on us, and that she's been tracking our movements ever since we arrived. Volgan demands that she proves she hasn't been working with us the entire time by cutting out our eyes, and she's perfectly willing to do so, but before she does, Eva runs over stopping her, leading to Ocelot asking why she's protecting us. He deduces that she is the spy in their ranks, playing a game of Russian roulette with her, but Snake realizes that the bullet is about to be fired at her, throwing his body into Ocelot, which causes him to stumble and shoot out Snake's right eye as a result. Ocelot and Volgan just laugh about this, leaving the room, before the boss shoots us in the leg and we see the strange man behind her again, showing us a radio frequency. Eva then quickly whispers an escape route to us after everyone leaves, saying that she'll recover our equipment and meet up with us later. We get taken back to our cell, and once here, we dial up the radio frequency we saw behind the boss, getting a message back saying that the door has been unlocked. We use this opportunity to escape, taking the sewer route that Eva told us about before she calls us, saying that Volgan has discovered that we escaped and put the whole base on red alert, sealing off the sewers and sending a search unit down there, meaning we need to get out of there fast. We eventually get cornered by the unit, with Ocelot backing them up, saying that he's been waiting to get a rematch with us before Snake simply jumps into the river below to escape. While we float down the river, Snake slips in and out of consciousness, having a nightmare along the way where we encounter the strange man that we've seen behind the boss throughout the game. He reveals himself to be the Sorrow, and here we get a very strange encounter where we have to trudge through this river while avoiding the souls of everyone that we've killed throughout the game, as well as these projectiles that the Sorrow himself fires at us. Thankfully, in my playthrough, I had killed only a very small handful of enemies, as the non-lethal options in MGS3 are just insanely powerful, so it made getting through this encounter much easier for me since there were way less souls to dodge. But after seeing every last person we've killed, Snake wakes up and frantically pulls himself out of the river before calling Major Zero and asking him about the sorrow. He explains to us that he was a very gifted medium, before Sigint chimes in, saying that the Sorrow was killed by the boss on a mission two years prior in Selinoyarsk. Eva then calls, telling us to meet her upstream, so we get moving again. We make our way up there, meeting her in a cave behind a waterfall, and getting our equipment back, complete with a snazzy new eye patch for Snake. She also gives us some of the C3 that she stole from the base, telling us that we can use it to destroy the Shagohod if we plant it on the fuel tanks in the hangar. She then tells Snake that her mission here was to get the Shagohod data from Sokolov, but even though she already has it, she's still going to help secure an escape route for us. 
And something weird with this game that I haven't brought up yet is that leveling up was left out again, much like an MGS2 and the Twin Snakes, but the health bar does still increase throughout the playthrough. I'm not entirely sure what's causing it, as for a while, I thought it was the boss fights increasing my health cap, but after paying attention to it, I can say that that's definitely not the case. But every once in a while when I was healing my injuries, there was a little sound chime that would play, so it might be that the health cap increases when healing injuries, but I'm not entirely sure, and I'm confident that some of you will be able to either confirm or correct me in the comments. Anyway, we make our way back to Groznygrad, sneaking our way back into the main hangar and planting the C3 on the fuel tanks around it. Shortly after doing so, Volgan and Ocelot appear with a captured Eva before we're suddenly ambushed by the boss, who, again, swiftly kicks our ass. Volgan then reveals that when he captured Eva, she was carrying a piece of film that he says is the Philosopher's Legacy. Snake asks him what the Philosopher's Legacy is, with Volgan explaining that America, China, and the Soviet Union created a blueprint together during World War II to defeat the Axis powers. They created various new weapons, but they also pulled together a massive sum of money that was supposed to be split between them equally at the end of the war. However, Volgan's father was one of the men who created the legacy, and he had planned things very specifically from the start so that the Soviet Union would keep all of the funds from it, and the microfilm of all the transactions was eventually passed down to Volgan, which he then used to build everything that we've seen throughout the course of the game. The boss tells him that she's going to dispose of Eva for him before whispering to her and nodding to Ocelot on her way out. Ocelot wants a rematch with us, but Volgan removes his gloves for the first time in the game, saying that we're his to deal with. He then suddenly powers up his lightning, burning his jacket off and revealing some sort of high-tech suit beneath. Ocelot tosses our pistol and knife down to us, and the boss fight with Volgan begins. It's a pretty janky fight, with us needing to avoid his lightning bolts and bait out his close-range attacks, then shoot him in the back whenever we get the chance to. After we deal enough damage for Volgan to realize that he might lose, he demands that Ocelot shoots us, before Ocelot reveals that he made a deal with the boss and simply walks out of the hangar. We continue our fight with Volgan until we manage to land enough shots on him, and Snake escapes the hangar while leaving Volgan behind to blow up with it. Once we make it out, Eva picks us up on her motorcycle, and we manage to escape just as the hangar goes up in flames. Eva explains to us that the boss let her go after they left the hangar, and that she's waiting for us at the lake where Eva hid our escape plane. She says that she doesn't want us to go and fight with her, but she knows that we have to, before the Shagohod suddenly bursts out of the side of the hangar, with Volgan piloting it straight towards us. Eva hits the gas on the motorcycle, and we get this amazing escape sequence where we're chased through the base by the Shagohod, guards, and even Ocelot on his own bike. And for anyone who enjoyed the crazy over-the-top action of the Twin Snakes' cutscenes, you'll probably love this sequence, as a lot of that sort of action is very present here. We eventually lure the Shagohod out onto a bridge where Eva planted some explosives, and we get to manually snipe the C3 right as it passes over, dropping it into the water below. And just as Snake says it's over, it comes flying back out, except now it's missing its big shell of armor, so Snake and Eva get back on the bike to actually destroy it for good this time. And the Shagohod fight is very visually interesting, but in terms of mechanics, it's incredibly simple. We need to hit the drill treads with rockets to disable them for a short time, and once Eva pulls around to the back, we can hit it in the weak spot that would normally be covered up by its armored shell. Eva does all of the driving around the Shagohod for us automatically during this fight, so all that we're required to do is just select the RPG from our inventory and shoot at the Shagohod. We eventually manage to do enough damage to disable the controls, but Volgan then climbs back out of it, punching his way through the top and grabbing the wires so that he can continue to control it with his lightning. Eva tells us to jump out of the motorcycle, and once we do, she uses herself as bait so that we can shoot Volgan in the back, and after we've hit him with enough bullets again, he starts to gather all the strength he has left for one final push before lightning strikes him, setting him on fire and overloading him with electricity, killing him on the spot. And as Snake says that it's now finally over, guards from the base start to catch back up with us, so we hop back on the motorcycle to make it to the escape point. We get another chase sequence, except this time going through the jungle, before we suddenly crash into a log, sending both us and the motorcycle flying off a small cliff. Snake gets off relatively unharmed, but Eva was impaled by a tree branch on landing, and she tells us to leave her there and go find the boss. 
Snake explains to her that he still needs her to pilot the plane out of there, so she pulls herself off the branch and we treat the injuries so that she can keep going. This leads to an escort mission where we have to take Eva to the escape craft, and it is fucking miserable. Eva walks at a snail's pace because of her injury, and she stops whenever guards get anywhere near us, and to make it worse, the guards are also infinitely spawning, meaning that as soon as we kill one of them, the game will simply spawn another to take its place. And to make this even worse, Eva barely even works half the time, with her just consistently refusing to move even after the guards have been completely wiped out. And one time when I was trying to get her to move again, I accidentally knocked her out, leading to one of the most hilarious discoveries of my playthrough. Knocking Eva out and dragging her unconscious body to the lake is significantly more efficient than playing this section as intended, and takes almost all of the frustration out of the entire endeavor. I'm glad that I was able to find a way to make this go by more easily, but this section of the game just feels hilariously incompetent, and it would have been totally disingenuous of me to not talk about it in this video. Eventually, we managed to make it to the lake, with our escape craft sitting on the water exactly where Eva said it would be. She says that she's going to get the craft ready for takeoff, while we handle the boss on our own. So we go out, finding the boss in the middle of a field of flowers, and asking her why she's doing all this. She tells us that after World War II, the world was torn apart and she wants to make it whole again. She explains that what nations are viewed as an enemy or an ally simply changes with the times, and soldiers are forced to just do what they're told and play their role. She's sick of the power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union, and wants them to be allies again like they were during the war. She then explains some things about the philosophers, revealing herself to be the daughter of one of the original members of the group. She also tells us that she and the Sorrow had a child together years ago, but that the child was taken by the Philosophers, never to be seen again. She then says that one of us needs to die, and whoever wins will inherit the title of boss, and whoever inherits that title will know nothing in life but endless battle. The fight begins, and once again, I found this one fairly disappointing. I think that what you're supposed to do here is run from cover to cover, finding opportunities to pop out and hit your shots on her, but much like the fear fight, I almost instantly found an incredibly easy way to get through it. Whenever you lay down in the flowers in this fight, the boss just won't be able to see you even with subpar camouflage concealment, so you can simply crawl around in the flowers with an automatic weapon equipped and hit her with a barrage of bullets whenever you manage to get close to her. And even though the flowers are super thick and it's hard to see, whenever she moves across the field she sends petals flying up into the air, making it incredibly easy to track her. Eventually, we manage to hit her with enough rounds, and as she's dying, she hands us the Philosopher's Legacy, as well as her rifle, telling us to kill her. The game then hands control back over to the player, requiring you to manually pull the trigger, and when you do, your mission is finally complete. We return to Eva and take off to leave Selinoyarsk. But just as we're getting off the water, Ocelot appears, shooting out one of the engines on the plane and jumping inside to confront us. He tosses our gear out the door, and he and Snake start to fight in the back of the plane. After a while, he pulls his revolver, with Eva throwing us one as well, but both of us are empty. He loads one round into one of the pistols, juggling them around and placing both of them on the ground before asking for our name. Snake tells him that his is John, and Ocelot says that his is Adamska before letting us choose which gun we want to take. We choose one and he grabs the other, and the two have a classic western duel with Snake having grabbed the gun with the bullet. It hits Ocelot, but he laughs and reveals that the round was a blank anyway, saying that the two of them will meet again before jumping into the lake. With less weight in the plane, we're able to lift off properly, and Snake and Eva finally escape. The two of them spend the night in Alaska doing what me and your mom did last night, before Snake wakes up to find that Eva disappeared in the middle of the night, leaving a recorded message for him. In this message, she reveals that she never worked for the KGB at all, and that she was actually a spy for China. She then explains that her real mission was to locate and steal the Philosopher's Legacy, and that she never even had to kill Adam, as for some reason, he simply never arrived to meet us. She explains that she was taken in as a child by the Philosophers and trained to become a double agent, and she works directly for the remaining Philosophers in China. She was also supposed to kill Snake once the mission was complete, but she made a promise to the boss after she spared her that Snake would be spared as well, so she simply disappeared into the night with the Philosophers' legacy in hand. 
We then get to see Snake receiving a medal from the president, with him saying that Snake has exceeded even the boss herself, and so he bestows him with the title of Big Boss to honor his achievements. We then get more of Eva's message, explaining that the boss never actually defected to the Soviet Union, and that she was actually sent there to retrieve the philosopher's legacy and bring it back to Washington. They had everything planned out, but they never predicted Volgan firing the nuke after the virtuous mission, and once Khrushchev demanded that the US clean up the situation, the government used us as an unknowing agent to do so. Future generations all over the world will hate her, with Americans seeing her as a traitor, and the Soviets seeing her as a woman who brought a nuclear disaster to their nation. She knowingly sacrificed herself to Snake, knowing that if she did, it would cover up America's entire involvement in the first place, giving her own life for the future of her country, the same country that had already hung her out to dry and ordered her death. And so, for one final scene, we see Big Boss visiting her grave, placing her rifle and some flowers on it, and saluting her. We then get one final wall of scrolling text, and while a lot of this is just fun little stuff to wrap up certain side characters' stories, there are two things that stand out here. The first is that the United States manages to steal the Philosopher's Legacy back, rounding up all remaining members of the group and renaming them to the Patriots. And of course, the Leon Fon Terrible project giving birth to the sons of Big Boss. And after all that, the credits roll. The way that this game contextualizes Big Boss's actions in the first two Metal Gear games is fantastic, especially since it never actually needed to be done, as the majority of players who played Metal Gear Solid 1 and 2 never even got to see the character in action back in Metal Gear 1 and 2. It was totally unnecessary, and Kojima easily could have just made the follow-up to the cliffhanger from MGS2, but instead he took the time to flesh out the original bad guy of the series and the lore of the entire world, and I'm honestly really glad that he did, as this story is great in that context. And of course, we get one final post-credits discussion, with Ocelot speaking on the phone, confirming that the boss has been dealt with, and that the philosophers can finally be revived. He reveals that the film that Snake and Eva retrieved was a fake planted by them, and that he obtained the plans for a new nuclear attack system from Granin's office that he believes will prove very useful down the line. He then reveals that he was actually Adam, and that he's been working for the director of the CIA the entire time before hanging up. It's nothing like the incredible cliffhangers of MGS 1 and 2, but it wraps up the story of this game very nicely and gives Ocelot an even stronger connection to the events of the later games in the timeline. Overall, much like most of the Metal Gear games so far, I really loved Metal Gear Solid 3. I loved the setting, the new depth that's been added to the stealth mechanics, and most of all, the way that the story recontextualizes everything that came before it. But here's the part of the video where I'm going to say something a little controversial. I don't think that Metal Gear Solid 3 is my favorite Metal Gear game so far, and I definitely don't think it's the best one either. It's not that the game is bad, because it's not, it's fantastic, but compared to how few flaws there were in the designs of both MGS 1 and 2, I think that Metal Gear Solid 3 has a lot of things that feel either half-baked or just poorly thought out. Things like the camouflage, the cure system, the changes that were made to the inventory management, the camera, the disappointing boss fights, as well as just having some sections like the EVA escort that are simply put, absolute disasters in terms of execution. Add on to that that the Cobra group are just flat characters with random abilities compared to some special forces groups like Foxhound that have deep backstories that were tied into the game's central themes, and you've got a game that, at least when it comes to a formal review, is hard to rate higher than or even equally to its predecessors. I would like to throw out there that when it comes down to just pure personal enjoyment, I would say that this is my second favorite game in the series so far, and the renewed emphasis on the gameplay is definitely a huge part of that, but a mid to high 9 just feels like a score that's too generous when looking at this game under a critical lens. So at the end of the day, I'm going to give Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater a 9.1. Hey guys, sorry for dumping another ridiculously long video on you. Unless you're into that sort of thing, in which case, you're welcome. If you're looking for more full series retrospectives like this one, I have a couple playlists for you right here, and if you want to help support more content like this, maybe check out my Patreon page and be a part of the incredible group that makes this all possible. Thanks a lot guys, and I'll see you right here for the next Metal Gear review.